Thanks to God for the kind of good now. It looks like there's more violence in the crowd and gay people. Anyway, so the, the idea was that, uh, okay, how many gay people? Not bad. Okay. <laughs> and of course, people in the Zoom can't raise their hands. Um, they can. Okay, they can. Uh, unless they're watching Netflix. Uh, yeah. So the idea was to, of course, talk a little bit about something that we are doing and possibly to explore uh, some collaborations or ideas that can emerge. Uh, I also, with uh, you know, uh, the, the idea was to also connect with theory students and initiate small group discussions between theory students and college students so that you guys can communicate with each other and engage with some topics across the lab so that you can do things and ultimately, you know, maybe you come up with an idea that none of us will ever talk about and why not solve the problems. The third and uh, equally important thing is to hopefully kickstart this as a platform where, you know, if uh, theory physics people are interested, maybe host a biologist once in every so many months so that we can have more interactions and then uh, potentially exploit the the options that we have and you know there's a huge scope at least the way i see it from biology and theory that we can collaborate and do things and biology colleagues until recently unfortunately uh unfortunately have been collaborating with theory people outside the institute so i think why do that we might as well do it in house is the idea so that's the thing so for today's talk of course i'm going to anchor it on something that we have been doing in the lab over so many years uh but last we talk about something that uh has uh, you know, happened in the recent uh, couple of years, but then uh, uh, make it more like a discussion so that we can you know, exchange views on how we can think about order and chaos and butterfly effect effects in biology. Uh, something that I think theory physics people are completely aware of, biologists may or may not be aware. And I would like to state that, you know, like my content is not gonna be precise until, unlike most of you guys, uh, because biology is imprecise, so that's so I hope you'll be able to bear, bear with that. Okay, so um, the main uh, interest in our lab has always been to look at how disordered order comes happen, and because biology is extremely disordered to begin with, and uh, there's a lot of chaos, and I'll give you some examples of uh, how uh, systems are chaotic, but then there is some order to it. Um, Okay, so even though most of you might be familiar with this, but uh, even for biologists, I would like to start off by saying that ultimately what we are all interested in is looking at the phenotype, which is a trait that all of us express. The traits can be very simple like skin color, but even more complex traits like lifespan, reproduction, reproduction can be complex traits. You can also, you know, in, in some sense, uh, extrapolate traits to species, to bio, biospheres and biosystems. But uh, essentially what we all have heard is that uh, the phenotypic output of an organism, or like I said, even a, a, you know, a skin tone, is an interplay of genotype and environmental inputs. And not surprisingly, therefore, all of us understand that uh, you know, life on Earth has evolved because of constraints and bottlenecks that has, uh, uh, you know, uh, that the organisms have had to overcome. And most of physiological patterns that we have is a, a sum total of all the bottlenecks that the organisms have to go through. And then what we are is essentially because of those things. Now, uh, the traditional molecular biology perspective of uh, biology, I mean, or the, let's say the classical view of biology is if you understand genes and genetic pro products, you'll understand molecular components. And of course, that what, that's what gives you uh, phenotypic outputs. But increasingly, it's turned out that actually it's the inverse. The, it's the environment that in, in fact influences your genotype because evolution of new genes, mutations that occur, hotspots that arise are all because of constraints that are you know, applied at, as an environmental input at the, uh, at the uh, for example, in a human's let's say, lifestyle. And that's what remodeled the system. And when you go through a bottleneck, a new gene product or a new gene variant uh, evolves. What biologists unfortunately don't think about, including me as much, is uh, the role of em en energetics and thermodynamics. We have not even brought thermodynamics into, into biological systems the way I understand, because every reaction has a lot of thermodynamic parameters that count this. 
including let's say binding and unbinding events that happen all the time uh, between proteins, between genes, uh, you know, membranes, fluidity of the membranes. And biologists have refrained from going anywhere near thermodynamics. Some amount of energetics has already come into picture, but again, that is uh, very rudimentary. And unfortunately, uh, the scale at which we understand how energetics plays a role in governing biological system is still largely uh, not clear. So, so I didn't even. Yes, this is already a departure from what one normally thinks that yes, you know, the genetic code is something sacred. Yeah, and uh, you know the. During my lifetime, whatever I do, yeah. the genetic code is not modified. But yeah. apparently, you are saying that the environment can also influence genes. Hugely. So, what the genetic code does is give you a constraint on what can be done. What all can be done is essentially governed by the environment. Right? So, that you can't become a dog suddenly or a frog is encoded in the genetic uh, uh, you know, milieu. But what kind of human you will become? is not only because of the genes, it's also because of these other environmental inputs and non-genetic elements that control biology. So you have a buffer, you have some constraints that are applied because of genetics. For example, if you have a mutation that causes a disease, yeah, for sure you will get a disease. But then it's not so deterministic. You have a genetic products which can give you a buffer, but what space you, uh, you know, uh, uh, Occupy in this particular buffer zone is largely dependent on the environment. Yes. So the back reaction on, on the on the gene that's only in like mutations, which are rare. Events. Yeah, which are rare events, but on evolutionary time scales they're not so rare. Right? No, the time scale of a single human. That's what. So at the time scale of a single human, the expression of genes, which are not based on mutations, are actually not uh, so uh, in. Right. But I'm talking about the back reaction, the changing of the genes. That Correct. Way. The changing of the genes per se as codes are you know very few and happens over evolutionary time scales right. but the expression of the genes and what the gene products do are happening all the time in fact at the millisecond, millisecond time scales right because the operational uh, component of biology is not gene the operational component of biology is metabolites and proteins right and proteins and metabolites are undergoing dynamic changes at millisecond time scales and that is what is giving you phenotype problems i hope that came out convincing Many geneticists in the crowd may disagree with me, but I can argue with me endlessly and then say this is what I'm saying is true. So this top red arrow there, yeah. uh, which is about the back reaction of the genes, yeah. it means that proteins that are eventually made, that can be affected by environment, but not the genetic code. Genetic, the, the, how much of the genetic code is expressed is regulated by metabolism. So you've heard of this, what is called epigenetics. Right? which is the uh, mo modifications of histones that happen. Histones are proteins that bind to the DNA and wrap the DNA, and uh, in the ability of the DNA to be accessible is determined by histones. And histone modifications are all metabolism driven. So you can bring in a metabolic change, you can, you can have the genetic code, but you may not express the gene if the gene doesn't get exposed. So that is where the back reaction happens. Okay? What phenotype can get changed so that the quantifying? Many things, including skin tone, disease outcome, height, weight, muscle the mass, your ability to think, your neural cognitive functions, all of this can be regulated by this. Okay. So, um, in fact, uh, people have shown that even for development, the body axis is also determined by metabolic inputs. So, you good statistics on that? Yes. I mean, statistics, I don't know. Studies are there. But in terms of uh, causality, there is uh, enough uh, evidence to say that there is causal mechanism about how back reactions can influence. But that's not backed by the statistics. Otherwise, not necessarily, right? Yeah, everything need not be statistically thrown because you have the variation of the phenotypes is much so much larger that it's difficult to say exactly what specific component. That's what I'm going to illustrate on, right? You have so many different parameters. We don't know exactly which parameter contributes to that uh, outcome, right? And that's precisely the reason why we should talk. Because if I have to open up a gene, there are 10 ways to open up a gene to express. Which of those 10 actually happen, you can't get it by statistics. Because it's extremely painstakingly finding a needle, you know, needle in a haystack. But one can design experiments to get that. Yeah. Yes, statistics may not help all the time, at least for a biologist. Okay. So um, essentially what I'm saying is that uh, I mean, we in the lab work on metabolism, energetics, many things. I mean, these are uh, words that are familiar with the biologists. And uh, what is also important is that biological systems are extremely complex. We have 
you know, multitudes of uh, um, reactions and uh, activities that are happening within the nucleus and the mitochondria, which is producing the energy. You have a lot of signaling happening in the cell. You have a lot of extracellular inputs. There is communication between cells, between tissues, across organ systems and across organ systems. So now if you want to think about how the phenotypic trait emerges, you have to look at the complexity of all the sum total of reactions that are happening. Essentially, what you do as an individual is actually a sum total of all of this. So therefore, kind of deconvoluting this becomes relevant. And unless you study this as a systems level, there's no point in addressing this about the causality or looking at universal properties of what parameter space your uh, you know, molecular mechanisms occupy to give you phenotype output, which is impossible to uh, answer. And what also becomes relevant is that there is an evolutionary history and a life history. That means you are evolved to have a certain physiological fitness because of evolution, but our lifestyles might be very disparate and far removed from your evolutionary history. Just for an example, exposure to light was not an evolutionary trait that we uh, encountered. But right now we are exposing ourselves to too much light. So that is causing a discordant uh, behavior within the biological system. And that's one of the causes for diseases, for example. For example, right? So, therefore, how do uh, mechanisms that were evolved to give you a fitness across evolutionary time scales, how do they align with life history traits becomes extremely relevant? So, the deviations is what is giving you diseases for you, you now, just as a, a point in discussion. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, therefore, studying this uh, across systems become relevant also because you want to identify evolutionary concerned mechanisms. And this is something that we have done. We work with flies, we work with mice, and we also work with humans. So that it gives you a perspective of what kind of properties and mechanisms might be fit to work in one organism or the other. And in some sense, you can come up with a you know, universal principle that is operative across. And we have done many things. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, the, also, the, the relevance is uh, the interaction between two key uh, of, uh, organelles, where one is the nucleus, the other one is the mitochondria. I think all of us know what mitochondria and organelles uh, and uh, nucleus are. are, are. I, I don't think any theory student knows this. Uh, needs an introduction. But if I want to put it in a very blunt manner, uh, nucleus is like a repository of information, which is like your CPU. Mitochondria is the one is like actually that is running the system because it's providing the energy and uh, encoding information. Um, your CPU will be more or less a dumb information without knowing the relevance of the information if you don't know what to query for. So in fact, what, what query, queries for information is the inputs that comes both within the cells and outside the cells which is one part is largely detected by mitochondria, not the only organelle, but this is one of the key things. And why is it become relevant? Because being a eukaryote or being a human essentially involved having a nucleus on the mitochondria. And in fact, the interaction between the two becomes relevant. Now, I'm not going to bore you with more biology, but essentially to say that this is again, we have a crosstalk at metabolic levels, molecular levels, organelle levels, cellular levels, and organism levels. And this is what is important. Okay. Now, if you want to think about how uh, systems operate, uh, one way is to look at is take a disease context and study what happens in a disease, right? Or look at younger, old, like a cancer, look at neurodegeneration, look at, uh, you know, uh, IQ level of something or something. And then you always find differences between the two uh, uh, populations, statistics, individuals at molecular level. But what led to that change is something that is what becomes more relevant to ask, right? Why did the system evolve into a particular dimension? to give you a particular phenotype. So that's what is relevant. So looking at emergent properties of molecules uh, is important and also fidelity of transitions. Now, why do these become relevant? It's because uh, biological systems, like I said, have a buffer space. That means you can operate between some buffer zones. Let's say if I put all of us through a stress, there is visual variance because all of us can mitigate some stress to some you know, level. But beyond a particular limit, all of us will fail, or you know there are you know extreme uh, constraints. But within this space, you also we always constantly keep oscillating, right? The so oscillation is what gives you fitness, and all of us as population also oscillate at different frequencies, and that is what is giving you as a fitness because some individuals will survive in if there is a, a bottleneck that uh, were to appear uh, in the environment, right? So therefore, this noise or this oscillation is important for providing fitness, not just at the individual level but also at the population. Now, this is also interesting because all biological uh, uh, you know, phenomena go through what are called phase transitions, or uh, let's say physiological transitions, right? Suppose you go through a sleep and a wake cycle, or an exercise and a rest cycle, or, uh, or a fed and a fast cycle. You constantly go through this state A and state B, right? You, you're, you're going back A to B, A to B. Now, suppose if you don't come back to the state A, right? You've, you've lost the memory of state A and state B, and then you become A prime. 
right? That means you have no memory of what your initial state was. There is a delta uh, you know, error that was uh, you know, uh, encoded in the system. And A prime becomes B prime, B become, become B, uh, A uh, double prime, and then you, uh, you know, emerge into a new state, right? And this is exactly what happens because biological systems are not 100% error proof. There's always error in biological systems, including in DNA replication. We, and that is again the benefit because the, the point of having error is to uh, allow the ability to evolve new phenotypes and uh, characteristics, right? So because of that error, I just start. So what happens is that it also is important for you to go back between two states as efficiently as possible with fidelity of transitions, which are both in terms of time, oscillation, periodicity, and uh, scale. Yeah, sorry. This is fine, but the problem is that the associated buffer component is good enough if you are only looking at two components and you're looking at the behavior of that. The problem is the moment the buffer zones change, right? So you don't know what other dimensions get affected. That's why it becomes uh, nonlinear. So when you come, to, you know, bring in a nonlinear uh, concept into this, you don't know what secondary effects get triggered on, which gives you an emergent problem. Okay. So the same like this, uh, certain So we are trying to quantify some of those, right? And uh, but for a limited set of parameters. Sure, you can't do everything. Yeah, you can't do everything at the same time. Now the reason I'm saying that even if you have a buffer zone, right? If I oscillate at a different frequency, right, or or, or uh, a scale, it's likely that the ability of this system at a later point to respond, it, it may never reach this point because there is a memory encoded to say that this is my buffer. For example, uh, just to give a very uh, bad, uh, uh, you know, uh, anecdote to this is that why did people with COVID uh, die when they had metabolic issues? Right? Because the baseline information was so high, the additional stress, the individuals were not able to cope. So why did they have high information? Because that was an emergent mechanism because of diabetes that happened 20 years ago. Right. 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 Your whatever dynamics you about this, your memory is well as not accepted. Yes, absolutely. All of these are going to be updated. Yes. So can we call the place of the living being as a B prime breaking the oscillation? Sorry? Can we call the place of a living being as a B prime is breaking the oscillation? B N. <laughs> Not B prime, B N. <laughs> right? Where everything stops. Anyways. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Death of an individual could be B N. Yeah. Okay. Great. Now, what we have been trying to specifically address uh, in the recent past is to ask what mechanisms give you the fidelity of trauma, right? Uh, again, something that you all will relate is that when you are, let's say, uh, uh, not feeding, you're largely going to be utilizing what are called fats in your system to provide energy for your biological system. When you're fed, you're largely consuming glucose to sustain your life system. This is true for all organisms, doesn't matter if you're a bacteria or, or a human, right? Now, suppose if there is an error in this utilization, and by chance, in addition to utilizing glucose, you also have to utilize fatty acids, or the other way around, that's when this starts happening. But when does this trigger point happen, we still don't know. What we can do is measure certain these for you know, some of these parameters, right? Okay. So, essentially, it's the fidelity of transitions and emergent properties that become relevant. And people have tried to address this in biology, but not to the extent one would like to do. And uh, this is where I think we can think about ways by which uh, either we can design experiment to specifically ask some very focused theory questions, or maybe we can provide data where you know people in theory can do this. Now, this is where the things become even more interesting, right? You have, let's say, some periodicity or oscillation of some phenotypic output that you are uh, you know looking at. Let's say this is uh, you know your muscle activity or you know cardiac rhythm. Each of this is dependent on, let's say, gene expression profiles, metabolic profiles, signaling cascade, hormonal pulses, ionic pulses, redox pulses. All of these actually map onto a higher dimension where you are seeing one heart pumping. But each of these has multiple subcomponents, which 
all of those have to work in this ping pong A prime, A, B, A, B, A, B. Any small element that you can accumulate will actually lead to a cardiac malfunction. And that is, in fact, in fact, emergent properties and chaos and order has been more uh, you know, well understood in, in, in cardiobiology than any other system, right? Okay, and this is happening at a cellular level, but we also have uh, you know, um, extrinsic cues that simulate or maintain this. Like I said, your circadian rhythms, your cell cycle, your fed pass cycles, your activity, all of this become. And then how do these systems interact with each other to give you a noise versus signal, spatial and temporal control of transitions and emergent property becomes clear. Um, so the way, other way of looking at it is that what are the systems that are chaotic in balanced space systems? What gives you order? I'm just listed a couple of those, right? What is chaotic is let's say a gene expression profile or let's say the amount of glucose. Suppose if I have to, I mean, all of you know that, uh, you know, insulin acts on cells and that leads to influx of glucose in most cells. Let's not worry about specifics, but let's say in in most cells, it's the action of insulin that brings in glucose. Do you really think every time insulin acts, exactly 10 molecules of glucose comes in? No. Do you think in a field of cells, if I apply X amount of stimulus, exactly the same molar concentrations of glucose go into all cells? No. What happens is that basically you have some, some noisy uh, you know, error range that uh, uh, the system operates in, which is a heterogeneous population, right? Now, this is chaotic. Similarly, if I want to transcribe a gene, if I say express the gene that gives you skin color, do you think every time this gene transcribed will give you only two mRNAs? No. It could be two or three or one, right? The same cell, when you sample at multiple time points, will likely give you different outputs. And across the field of cells, you again create more heterogeneity. That means you have chaos inherently uh, uh, you know, uh, present in the, in the system, but order is also provided by genes, right? For example, you have genes that gives you order, which is where I'm saying, whether you can have a trait or not is determined by the gene. How much of the trait you should have is determined by the chaos, right? So therefore chaos and order op always operate with each other. According to me, again, my concepts are going to be very different from how you view chaos and order, right? Okay, I'm going to just quickly pause here and see if there is some kind of feedback mechanism which tries to put everything in this, that average behavior. Of course. So the stochastic behavior, they may not be relevant in most average behavior. But what is average also changes when you age. That's what I'm trying to say. Right? So one is the population level average, one is the average for the individual itself. The average itself keeps shifting as time passes. So where is that emergent property coming from? That does not affect the next person. It does. For example, if you have uh, obesity uh, in let's say males, the next offspring almost always will develop diabetes. Okay. So if you reproduce at the age of 20 to 40, let's say, assuming you're healthy and you don't have obesity, your fitness of your, uh, the next offspring is much better. If you are obese or if you reproduce after 40, your offspring is likely, not likely, definitely will have uh, you know, higher vulnerability to develop diabetes in obesity. That's been known. Even uh, 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 behavioral aspects, anxiety and depression is also transmitted uh, across generations. So therefore, your average is not essentially something that is static. And it's inherited. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Or is it too difficult to, yeah. Uh, the entire discussion, at least from a business perspective, we're talking about multiple time scale. Yes. And as far as I could understand from the answer, is that these time scales are not exactly as far apart as you like. In the sense that there are certain time scales which are very far apart. Yes. So then, uh, I, I guess, sometimes you would think that certain, oh, Things happening, certain effects happening at this time scale will not affect your trajectory. Uh, uh, keep forward, or were you saying that it can happen in one generation itself? Yes. So, me at least, from my naive perspective, think that these times are not that far apart. Uh, of course, I can think of certain questions which are much further down the line yeah. and uh, I can get away with that. Yes. But you're saying that there's a spectrum of time scales which yes. you can't. 
yeah. chop off. Yeah. And can you chop off? And like, we can chop off. Of course, that's where I think uh, these are some some of these experiments are more doable in smaller organisms like bacteria, yeast, and flies, and where we have can you know put multiple lifespans within our lifespan. Okay. Really important, right? So what is also interesting is that uh, the time scales and the threshold of uh, response also matters. Right? So if I increase the step response, I might not need five generations to uh, bring about an evolutionary change, right? I might maybe do it in three generations. But if I have a very mild step, I may not need, need a change, or I might take you know eons to actually get uh, uh, that something that is changed, right? Absolutely. So therefore, the change is proportional to the the, the scale and the time both. It, there, it's a two. I mean, at least to me, it's a two-dimensional uh, interaction. We'll come back to this. Okay. Now, um, the other, uh, like I said, I did tell you about how in, even if I want to get glucose into my system, the system will never get exactly the same number of molecules of glucose. So that means the noise is very large, right? And if I even get 10 molecules of glucose, there's no guarantee that every time the cell utilizes that glucose, we'll produce exactly the same amount of ATP because the system is completely wired to have this the buffer and the uh, uh, and the inherent noise that is present in the system. And because there are so many reactions, each of those reactions have noise. And how do noise interact with each other is still unknown. Right? Am I making sense? Yeah? I don't want you to go to put you off to sleep. Okay. I'm, I'm still stuck at how obesity is in here. I mean, there's some Lamarckian. It is. It is both Darwinian and Lamarckian. If you're looking at a gene, yes, if it's it's Lamarckian. So it's like cutting the rat's uh, tail, and then there's the uh, no, that's Darwinian. <laughs> that's not so. How how is obesity in here? I mean, what, if we want to go into the mechanisms, I can. Like I said, this is where it becomes relevant. So if I have a gene that consumes glucose, okay, if the gene has to be expressed to X level, mm -hmm. right? There are, like I said, histones that occupy this gene. The DNA itself can do what is called methylation, which is called imprinting. Right? All of these derived from metabolism, all these modifications, all these decorations of the histones are all derived, derived from metabolism. If I decorate this gene differently, I will express this gene differently to X prime or Y. But how is that handed down to the next generation? Through your uh, germ lines. Through epigenetics, not through DNA sequences. Ah. Okay, so there is a memory encoded in the germ line that is passed on through the mother indeed. and the father. In fact, the father becomes equally more important. People always thought it's the mother. In fact, the epigenetic blueprint is largely derived from the father and not so much from the mother. This is interesting. That has been a completely paradoxical uh, view for that the biologists were uh, had to consider. Yeah. All, all statements are statistically true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if I take a hundred obese individuals, <laughs> yes. Yeah. If I take a thousand of obese individuals, the statistically their children will have. And not millions or just hundred. Mm -hmm. No, it depends. <laughs> like I said, I gave you a hundred thousand and a million also. You can look at millions as well. Yeah, right. But what is I didn't want to go into the statistics because many phenotypes or many uh, outputs are actually uh, bimodal. Right. You also have bicellular phenotypes. So which is interesting. The same population. Uh, there are uh, there's a very famous uh, uh, thing. You you take mouse that can become obese. Right. There's a particular gene mutation. Right. You put them high fat diet. Only 40% become obese, 60% don't become obese. Genetically, they're identical. Right? So, what do you do with the statistics? Is it true? Yes. Is it untrue? Also true. So, statistics doesn't help me there. Yeah, I mean, no, what I mean to say is that many phenotypes are quite stable. Therefore, a population might suddenly start to behave differently. For example, there's something called um, uh, social defeat or uh, many other behaviors. You take the mouse, you subject them to uh, stress. Some respond, some don't respond. It's exactly the same population. There's no genetic mutation. They are isogenized inbred. No problem. So that's where genetics gives you the order. But the chaos and variability comes from elements that we don't understand where they're coming from. Right? So yeah, statistically, if I take a 
thousand or ten thousand obese individuals, most likely they like. But I don't. The problem is uh, obesity is not the only reason why somebody would become their children would become diabetic, right? The reason that we can't apply is because somebody could argue there's a confounding factor in the children that some children actually you know ate more ice cream than the others. So it becomes difficult to apply statistics there. Right? And, and what I meant to say is that we don't have clean statistics data. Right? I can I can anecdotally show it, but to causally show the statistics is strong. Unfortunately, in my opinion, we don't have really high uh, you know resolution data for that. Okay, now I'm going to skip this because ultimately uh, there's also uh, phase transitions that happen at molecular scales because you can have proteins that are uh, present um, um, across, uh, let's say, they're present uh, throughout the system as individual protein molecules. They can all come together where reactions happen at a small, you know, small scale. That means I can have X concentration of molecules that are distributed in a volume, right? I can have X concentration of molecules you know, distributed in a volume by, right? But then if enzymes come together and work in a complex, then my the volume shrinks. That means my effective uh, concentration term increases non-linearly, right? Because I'm suddenly constraining the molecules to operate in a small, uh, small growth phase. That means I can exchange metabolites very uh, easily and get things done. Properly. Now, how do these, you know, enzyme molecules? Which like, suppose if I have protein one, protein to ten, some of these can form complexes. Some of these may not form, form complexes. Some of these form what is called liquid-liquid phase transitions. In fact, this is something that is also happening. Phase transitions in biology have become very popular, where your liquid concentrates that are formed, or even uh, um, that allow some kind of a uh, regulated expression or changes in reactions that happen in a constrained space. That gives you again a nonlinear change, and we don't know at what time scales they operate, right? So that's again an interesting thing. So I'm not going to go into the details. I'll skip that. I'll skip all of this. I'll... Okay. Now, um, just to give a glimpse of how we have applied a little bit of theory to um, uh, a biological problem that I think all of us also care about. Uh, in fact, this was done in collaboration with uh, somebody who was a physicist and uh, turned uh, biologist, uh, or let's say computational biologist called Ranjit Padinhetri. He's at IIT Bombay. I think he was a soft matter guy, if I'm not wrong, and then uh, turned into a biologist, okay? And then he does amazing, uh, you know, good science. Now, uh, the kind of questions that we ask here is, uh, and this is again something, you know, you guys might appreciate even though it's not biology, right? So whenever you think about biological system, there is always a stimulus, right? There is a stimulus that comes in, okay? And there is a response that is created, right? The response could be your movement, right? But then this involves, several reactions that happen in between. So th think about a signaling cascade. You have one input that comes in. You have, let's say, 100 outputs that are created. Right? The information per se is unity. Right? But the output is non-unity. How does one event that happens in the cell membrane, let's say this is insulin that comes and binds the receptor and creates multiple signals, Right? These are discrete, non-overlapping signals, both spatially, temporally, and quantitative. Right? None of these have the same value at any given time point, point in time. Okay? So how does one information give you, you know, very discrete quanta, which are non-overlapping, is, is, is a question that I always get excited about. I don't know what theory offers to explain this. And because biology always operates with this. You have one neurotransmitter that comes and binds. You have 100 different reactions that happen inside the neurons. How does what, that one event create this very discrete points is interesting? So it's like a Brownian particle which you're forcing. So there's a forcing agency. Yeah. But in the Brownian particle, so it has no noise in it. So therefore, it's Correct. Right? But then this cannot be totally stochastic because every time uh, that uh, uh, so event, there will be a force in every of the force that has been applied to the right. part. Right. So it will have some you know, you know, drift according to that, huh. but it will have the noise. Uh, it will have the noise, but every time it, the same uh, stimulus happens, you need to produce more or less the same buffer uh, quantum uh, information. Right. You can't deviate uh, dramatically because if you deviate, then you, you, you are dead. 
Yeah, so the drift has to be uh, more emphatic than the noise. Exactly. So what de de determines that drift versus noise becomes relevant and signal to noise thresholding is not very clear in balancing systems. What becomes the noise? I can I can think about a signal emerging because I've dampened this noise, right? And then biological system will think this is noise. Or I can I can simply increase the noise and my signal might disappear because the system has become too noisy and the system might say that I'm not responding to it. Right? Does that make sense? And in biological systems, I can give you several examples where simply dampening the noise, what was in the noise becomes a signal, or increase the noise, what was signal becomes noise. Yeah, so that becomes relevant. Okay. Now, um, people have done uh, you know, information theory, they have uh, looked at multiple uh, other theoretical approaches to uh, understand such uh, behaviors. Um, our uh, uh, interest was also that if I change the strength of the signal, Right? If I change the strength of the input, the force, how will I remodel uh, the downstream events? And can I set certain uh, you know, mathematical parameters to explain this behavior? Okay. Now, we use insulin signaling because insulin, of course, all of us know what insulin is. Again, I don't think theory students also really need this information. Unfortunately, uh, if you are not diabetic, you are considered to be abnormal. So, that's a simple diabetes anyway. So that means, uh, you know, all of us uh, know what diabetes is, which is basically insulin resistance or lack of insulin, depends on what you're thinking about. Now, insulin has two main arms. One is called a growth factor arm, the other one is called a metabolic arm, which is interesting. Now, insulin is required to build body mass. In fact, if you don't have insulin, your neurons completely freeze or, you know, uh, burn off. Uh, if you don't have insulin, your muscles atrophy and you become cachexin. So most often what you see as loss of muscle, loss of neurons, many of these events can be directly correlated with loss of insulin or loss of insulin uh, act action, right? It is also the arm that produces metabolism. That means it's the one that provides your energy. That means if you don't have insulin, you will not be able to walk because your muscles will not be able to consume glucose. So essentially you have two arms. One is the ability to build body mass. The other one is to sustain the body mass to do all the activities that the organism has to do. How do you now, if you have two different arms, there's a unit of information coming from there, how do you couple the two? How much of you know, metabolic arm should be uh, sustained? How much of the growth arm should be sustained? How do you parcelate the information into two discrete events, which of course have multiple <coughs> components? So that's one uh, thing that we ask. The second thing is, um, again, uh, looking at uh, memory and all of that, but more excitingly for us, Suppose you could think about an, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, ligand that is coming in. Let's say uh, if I have an input, input rises over a certain uh, uh, you know, quantum over a certain amount of time, and the uh, information also decays. At two different time points in your uh, you know, uh, activation paradigm, you'll have the input concentration to be the same because you have a rising curve and you have a falling curve. Right? At two different time points, you have the same quantum of information. But the biological system is not going to see this as, true, as the same quantum. The reason is that there's a memory of the system. There is a differential and an integrative response that this particular concentration is going to be uh, responding to. That means what happened here is actually dictate what's going to happen there. So you want to think about the integrative and the differential response between the components that uh, you know is important. And I tell you, biological, you know, biologists have largely not been able to look at this. And in fact, insulin is one of the most well-described components and we have done this. So um, I will not go into the details of this. Essentially what we uncover are very interesting things like what are called, um, you know, band pass filters, right? So we identified components that act as high pass filters and low pass filters. That means you need this particular signal to come in for the entire system to respond, right? And the system is saturated by certain component. So basically you're putting high pass and low pass filters. And this high pass and low pass filters is also dependent on the concentration of the, uh, or the, the amount of the quantum of information that you're getting. That means if I have to respond to insulin, if I have to set some thresholds within which systems should oscillate, who sets these thresholds, right? That was not clear. Thanks to the kind of experiments that we did, we showed what sets the high pass filter and what creates the low pass filter. So your banding becomes relevant, and that's where the system is, uh, you know, operating at some frequency and uh, amplitude. 
what is also interesting, which is, uh, you know, again, mathematically, one would potentially uh, think about, if I, if I think, if I say that there is some component that gives you peak amplitude, that means if I take a response, an input I, is it, you know, directly, you know, proportional to the response, right? And also, what is the time component here? Right? How long does this response last as a function of the input strength? Right? One is the scale, the other one is how long this response will last. What we showed is that this is a totally nonlinear uh, system where your peak amplitude is not correlated with DK time. That means some components show rapid decay and some components show very low, slow decay, which means there is again a feedback and a feed forward loop. This is what is tuning the entire uh, system, right? I can have something that comes up very fast and goes, and something that comes up but sustains. What creates these differences were not clear, and we identified some of those components. Sir, on, the, on that graph, could you say what the axes are? Yeah, so this is my amplitude. Amplitude of what? Some response. Okay, this is time. Time. And where is this, like, for instance, the insulin level would be where? So I brought the insulin here. Okay. okay. Now let's say I'm, I'm measuring the quantum A and quantum B. Okay. And these are two different curves at different insulin levels? No, it's the same insulin level. What are the two curves? Let's say component A and component B. Right? But if I change the insulin level, if I have a different color, this A might actually show this. And the question you're asking is how do you predict these curves? Yes. And what mathematical parameters actually determine the response. See, given an insulin level, you'd like to be able to compute the shape of these curves. Yes. All right. And, and we were able to do that. Okay. So, 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 so when you say you understood where the thresholds come, you understood as if as if something that emerged out of some kind of self-organization, or you understood them from biological mechanism. As a biological mechanism that you not as something where it's some evolutionary dynamics which will set these uh, pressure. Yeah, we don't know what sets this. We still don't understand what sets that. Okay. So, maybe related to when you said you were able to understand, uh, could you fit the curves or you produced the model that reproduced? Exactly? Yeah, so we could, uh, we did both uh, uh, you know, the simulations and also the classic modeling. And based on experimental thing, we you know used something as a training set and then we looked at it. We could essentially fit the curves, right? But then later we could, when we by by artificially changing the insulin concentration, which was not experimental treatment, we could predict that. So you have a model with many parameters, yes. Fits all the parameters and then predict it. Yeah. yeah. And that you why that becomes relevant because this is what is happening in our uh, lifetimes and also. Sorry, yes. Yeah. Okay. This model when you write down. What is the basis for writing them? Is it like a function fitting model or is that a physical mechanism? Yeah. It's a function. Then you ask the question where does this function fitting model origin look from? The question is uh, what determines the the the, 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 the response rate, yeah, the parameter space. Yeah. So you would like the physical mechanism to explain your function. Yes. That would be it. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Unless the other thing is that you, ah, so here, for example, yeah. you mentioned the memory effects yeah. that how the same insulin level yeah. affects uh, you depends yeah. on you know what has happened in the past. Yeah. So that also you take into account. Yeah, your... actually. So um, basically, what we did is also ask. Um, so the other thing that we asked is suppose if I have this unitary information coming from, we have discrete quantum of information, right? They, all of these four different. Uh, uh, scalar quantities in terms of in the in the sense they are quant quantitatively different, they have time responses which are different. What restricts them to show this particular behavior? We actually computed kinetic constants, right? Like look at K on and K ops and show that in a Leiden concentration dependent manner, your kinetic uh, uh, thresholds change, right? That means for the same component number one, doesn't matter what it is, by changing the uh, the insulin concentration, my K on and K ops are dramatically changing. So that means we show that simply understanding the components is not sufficient. What happens as a time response uh, becomes relevant. So the kinetics becomes relevant. So if you understand the kinetic behavior, you'll be able to actually predict what's going to happen in the, in the system. So the behavior is going to be largely kinetically driven, not simply based on the 
the the the the IP address for the multiple threads. That makes sense. Sorry, how how does this translate into your functions? Okay, so for example, if I think about uh, something that has been sustained for a single for a long long time, my payoff could be three. What is payoff? Payoff. So payoff is the rate of decay of the information. Yeah. Right. Uh, or the other constant. Right. K on is the rate of so exponential. It need not be exponential. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The other thing is, uh, what? Absolutely. Yeah. Is KO a new parameter or is it determined by incident level? Huh. Good question. We don't know that. Whether K all is determined by the incident level, possibly yes. Because we, again, this is new discovery. What we found is that concentration of the insulin actually activates mechanisms which are feedback and actually uh, dampen the uh, So that K off is essentially now in retrospect predicted by the insulin function. If I change the insulin, my chaos will change. But that was not evident before we did this. This k of is the, the unit of uh, this is second inverse. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing is, uh, this is where the memory question comes in. Again, most biologists don't know that uh, um, when you're in a faster state, your insulin is produced at you know sub nanomolar pulses, which is 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes when you are not eating a diet, which is like let's say when you're sleeping, your insulin is produced at 0 0.1 nanomolar concentration, right? Now, this happens every 15 minutes because your insulin secreting cells pulse at every 15 minutes. In fact, there's a lot of theory to say of what creates this pulsatile behavior of perfect 15 minute oscill uh, oscillations. But the pancreas itself is a large organ. What makes sure that it produces exactly 0 0.1 nanomolar or less than some error, you know, margin of error, what uh, it's regulates? And then when you feed a diet, it goes through a large amount of insulin because you have consumed a lot of glucose, you want to utilize all of those foods, right? Now, here, this is a continuous response. Here is a discrete response or a discrete input, right? So we said, is it likely that this kind of information actually encodes memory there? And essentially, we modeled it. What is interesting is that this is where um, uh, the question becomes important. So depending on the concentration, so we, in this, <coughs> model, we have pulsed insulin at every 15 minutes, like what is happening in our bodies. And then we go through a fed insulin, right? If you do this continuously, what, what we expect is that this particular uh, component that is supposed to respond to insulin, I would assume that if an event A should happen, if I pulse this every 15 minutes, the quantum of A should increase, normally would Because there is a uh, cumulative uh, accumulate from the signal, and my expect that my signal every 15 minutes to accumulate over a period of time. Instead, what was completely unintuitive is that my signal decayed, right, with 0.1 nanomolar insulin. That means, like what you are saying, that at very low concentration, the system was actually going through a phase of non activation, but progressive deactivation to create a new baseline. Okay. Yeah. Why is this relevant? Suppose if I feed after that particular thing, my dynamic range of response will be much larger. It's almost like saying, if I have to create a flood uh, in a response system, if this room were to take, uh, you know, take care of the flooding system, every time someone of water came, if water remained here, when the flood happened, there won't be any buffer capacity to respond. Whereas every time a small amount of uh, you know, water came in, if the floor started going down, I would create a much more buffer space and my dynamic range of response will be much larger. Right? This was very unintuitive. This is where the ligand concentration is dictating the K of ratios. How? I don't know. I know biologically what is happening, but mathematically or in terms of the parameters, what dictates this nonlinear behavior, I, I have no idea. Okay. So if I infinitely play with the concentrations, where is the threshold that breaks is unclear, right? Okay, now, lastly, what happens if I do the opposite? Suppose if I continuously feed with high, high concentrations of insulin, let's say, assuming that we all drink coffee every two hours or you know, eat our meals every two hours, without a fasting phase where your insulin goes through 0.1 nanomolar, basically the system shuts down. And what happens is that uh, certain signaling arms get shut down, certain signaling arms get uh, uh, you know, strengthened. This is the metabolic arm, this is the growth factor arm. 
In fact, in cancer, this is exactly what happens. If you have more proliferation that happens, then in fact, all of these components have been otherwise shown to be important in cancer and they undergo mutations over a period of time. So what we're saying is that insulin concentration actually wires the signal caskets. Now, we show that this is also relevant in terms of connectivity. We applied uh, uh, you know, different multiple uh, correlations and we show how connected the system is. Uh, if you have a pulse uh, adapted insulin, the system is much more connected. If you have a repeat insulin, the system is completely disconnected. It makes sense because this is what happens in, in a deep state. I'll quickly skip to what concepts I wanted to discuss. And this is where, given all of this, I, I would like to talk about, right? Now, this is a very old uh, um, paper that I, I picked up specifically very old papers because, uh, you know, in the recent past, people have applied it. It just churned out the same concept. No new thing has been applied, right? Now, essentially what I want to talk about is order and chaos, right? And here is an example of how order and chaos happens. And this is uh, basically the response of a particular enzyme. When you have constant supply of substrate, when you have highly uh, supply of substrates, and when you have, you know, you have some frequency oscillation of the substrate. You go through a periodic oscillation here, you go through a periodic oscillation, a quasi-periodic uh, oscillation, and a chaotic oscillation, right? Now, why does the enzyme behave in all these three, three different states is unclear. But this is experimentally determined value, right? If I provide enzyme, let's say this is an enzyme that consumes glucose, right? And it consumes, it makes the first reaction from glucose to glucose 6 phosphate. The biologist will understand this. This is an enzyme E, right? If I produce, if I give excess of glucose, a constant level of glucose, I produce a periodic response, right? If I provide sinusoidal glucose, I produce a periodic response, a quasi periodic response, and a chaotic response, right? Whereas, again, if I change the, uh, the frequencies, I'll have very different outputs. Sorry, depending on what? what periodic, quasi periodic, chaotic, depending on what? But depending on the concentration of the glucose ramp. So the amplitude of the, the amplitude. amplitude of the right? Now, which is which is the same enzyme? I'm doing this reaction 100 times in the lab, and I get these different modes of output. Right? What generates this in a, cha in a chaotic and ordered responses is still unclear for biology. Sorry, when you say chaotic, this is chaotic by I or? Quantitatively, quantitatively, quantitatively these people have actually looked at it. They've uh, looked at um, what is called your um, attractors and all that. Yeah, people have done The amount of dimension is what we call the amount of index. Is that uh, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, this is not surprising because all of us understand that uh, uh, to me, uh, in a biological system, are from far from, from equilibrium, right? In fact, they're not just in uh, uh, disequilibrium, but actually far from equilibrium. And uh, emergence of new unpredictable information always occurs in dynamical chaos and you know, from it alone. That's what people are playing with. In fact, if you want to have emergence, you need to have dynamical chaos so that you, you know, sample the space enough so that you have emergence of uh, phenotypes, right? And for example, in the context of mutations, also, uh, you know, this becomes relevant and this is what collectively also contributes to butterfly effect. So the, the main point that I wanted to discuss today was that aging itself could be a bad butterfly effect. Right? What do I mean by that? You have, you know, your daily oscillations of feed and fast cycles, your fat and faster states, your sleep and wake cycles, your neuronal activity, your muscle activity. All of those are, you know, multiple oscillations that happen at some time scales and frequencies. Each of these have a very small effect on the balance. Collectively, non-linearly, they can impinge with the emergent property to give a butterfly effect, which is aging. So is aging and emergence of diseases at the age of 40 or 50 or whatever is itself a butterfly effect, right? Can we think about components that drive this butterfly effect and how does uh, an organisms respond to these uh, changes? So otherwise, if you want to simply think about mutation as a thing, because like you said, mutations are not good enough to explain the phenotypic variation that we have and for an individual uh, uh, organism to have you know, death at a particular time point cannot be exclusively explained by uh, mutations. In fact, people have shown that it's not a you know, mutation based exclusive, right? So what matters is this butterfly effect where small changes that start off very early in life, accumulate over a period of time, give you an emergent property and cumulatively give you an output which is 
an aging or 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 disease. Right? So when you are saying that aging is a butterfly effect, I don't understand why it is suddenly degrading. Why? I always get old. Why it's sort of happened that I always become young? So this is where I don't know. I agree with you. I completely don't understand that. But people have it's not exclusively my idea. People have thought about this. Uh, but there is a deterministic chaos here, right? It's not a completely stochastic process. There is a deterministic chaos here. And what is deterministic chaos? I mean, what parameters contribute to this deterministic chaos? Nobody understands. But biological systems and emergence of these, you know, light effect traits have been shown to have been speculated to be butterfly effect. Yes, it could have gone the other way around, but there's a deterministic chaos. So, is there a time stream to this butterfly effect? Yeah, why do all individuals get glasses at the age of 40? Yeah. Right? If it's mutation, all of them get the same mutation. Yeah. It's not. Right? Go to an eye doctor. I went and they said, like, when you return 40, you need to celebrate your 40th birthday. I said, how the hell do you know? She said, yeah, that's when people come to me with 40 glasses. So this is happened more or less predictably. And accelerated aging is happening in humans because of lifestyle changes. That means you have components that oscillate at some frequencies and amplitudes whose errors are increasing you know, very early in life. The emerging properties are very different. And that's what you are you're advancing the the aging I can measure quantities that give you phenotypes. Whether that actually contributes to the butterfly effect, I don't know. Right? That's where I think one needs to have a discussion of what constitutes a butterfly effect, what parameters I want to measure to actually capture the butterfly effect is right? Uh, that itself is something that one needs to be debated, right? Okay. Is aging something we can measure at the level of cells? Yeah. <clears throat> you take a cell from the body and from that you can use yes. how is that? Yes. We can. What 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 do you measure the cell? So there are certain properties of the cell, like uh, uh, we measure from enzyme activities that uh, is typically uh, you know associated with aging. Their inability to proliferate is uh, example of aging. So there are cells, you know. At least, balance, balance of three to some three or four parameters that people think, yeah, if this happens, the cell can age. And you can make, put a number, this person 50, 60, 70. For the cells. For the cells. No, but I was asking for the organism. Can you measure the age of organisms huh. by looking at the cells? No, that's the problem. See, the problem is, as the, the, there is a chronological age, there is a physiological age. Right? And uh, one of the problems that biologists are, are not able to comprehend is that I'm at look young. My heart might be young, but my liver might not be young. Right? Uh, my muscle might be very young, but my brain might not be very young. So, therefore, it becomes difficult to quantitatively, unless you define what measure you're looking. If I'm looking at zero cognitive specificity, yes, I can give you some very precise uh, yes. set of. Uh, so, it's a level of, level of organs that you can measure the age of an organism. Yeah, you can. But how does cumulatively that corresponds to the age of an organism? Nobody knows. Okay, okay? that's again. I know I'm, I'm throwing up more unknowns than knowns, so maybe it's not helping, but I just want to throw this, right? Um, so this, I think, this is really the butterfly effect context here. Yeah. Butterfly is something that's known, uh, but in some way, unpredictably effect cause a very large effect. So here, you are saying that some small accumulation of some things can yeah. affect deterministically something to happen. Yeah. For example, if I don't exercise enough, then I will be that might actually go into the disease. It happens pretty. Why are you talking about that? I didn't get the relationship. Predictably, in the sense, um, I can, in a mouse model, I can produce a predictable effect, but in humans, I can't produce it. If I define the, um, if I define the, let's say, onslaught, I can define the output. Okay. But in, in, a, in a real wild context, I have no idea what is the oscillations and what is the direction. So, for example, if I don't exercise enough, I, there's no way to predict whether the liver becomes target tissue, the brain, or the heart. I can't predict. Each of us will, will show different things. That is the lack of the current modeling that you have, or is it your thing that in principle, still with a lot of parameters, yeah. we would not be able to predict? We would not be able to predict. Yes. 
because it's not just because of what's happening in the muscle that will have an impact, because of the emergent property. There is some kind of cascade. There's some kind of cascade. Yeah, which we cannot intuitively uh, uh, present it as a predictable outcome. That, therefore, I'm calling this as a butterfly effect. Okay. And like I said, it's not just me, but I'm just explaining people have put led to the butterfly right? effect. Now, um, the other thing is, this is again an interesting thing that, you know, if you change the concentration of the enzyme, when I told you about concentration of the substrate that gives you, uh, uh, you know, uh, different periodicity, if you change the concentration of the enzyme, keeping the substrate the same, I can also produce different, uh, you know, oscillations, right? I simply have changed here the enzyme concentration from 0.5 micromolar to 0.5 micromolar. What does periodic become uh, here? That means I simply can vary the, 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 the two parameter spaces and I can produce a chaotic response or a periodic response. Right? When I have that, I would like to believe this is where the butterfly effect is also taking shape. Right? Because I can't a priori predict how much of exactly enzyme A will be produced in your body at you know reproducibly even over a period of one month. I can't predict. Okay. Okay. Now, um, and this is interesting because, for example, if you think about uh, the parameter space that this will occupy, this is glycolysis, which is basically consuming glucose to give you some end product. If I were to model or an experiment determine some of these components and say that each of these components can have range of values from X to Y, A to B, and M to N, Right, I can I can sample the space in multiple different ways. Right, so this is a periodic response according to these people, and this is a chaotic response. Right, and clearly, uh, and like I said, both the concentration of the glucose and the enzyme here. If I change this, I can go from a chaotic response to a periodic response, and I can oscillate between the two, two parameters. Right, which we still don't understand how things are happening in balanced Right. Um, Next, uh, I think I had one more. Uh, no, okay. So basically, the reason that becomes relevant is, like I said, we are measuring multi, uh, multiple uh, components here. All of them have emergent properties. And therefore, uh, I can think about this as an ordered chaos and whether there's a particular. Right? Okay, so I will stop lastly here. And if I have any more questions, I can take. Um, uh, essentially, people have shown what constitutes uh, noise, and noise itself is generated by, like I said, amount of uh, transcripts that are produced, amount of metabolites that are coming in. So I don't know how these operate. So one of the exciting questions or interesting questions that I had is how do how do two noise systems interact? Right. So if I, if I have let's say if a response is contributed by events A, B, and C. If each of these have noise, right, there would be a concept something called noise averaging compensation or cooperation, right? I can average out noise to give you a thing, right? I can have interaction of noise with each other to amplify the noise, right? Now, at least I've had some interaction with some, you know, this is like a large India file, but at least from their perspective, you know, I don't think anybody has looked at how noise is done. What is the noise noise right? So when do noise cancel out? When do they amp amp and amplify? Can we provide some biological properties or, or uh, parameters to even address it from a theory perspective, right? So if I have noise here, if I have noise here, if I have noise here, some of these noises can interact with each other to produce a cooperation. And in fact, that has been actually shown in this particular um, story where, um, Yeah, in this in this particular thing, for example, noisy metabolism can actually provide a, you know microbial uh, thing. So suppose if I take a population of bacteria, the noise is very high among uh, uh, individuals, and there is noise is important because the product of the reaction from one bacteria helps to uh, you know feed the bacteria and the neighbor in the, in the, in the neighboring. So that means there is a cross feeding. That means noise cancels out to give you a cooperative uh, interaction. So can we think about how noise interact with each other to produce a particular response? Uh, is also an interesting concept, and I don't know if in theory people have asked how do noise interact with it? When does noise actually show uh, an emergent property? Does can noise also have an emergent? I don't know if these questions are even relevant or not.
I mean, mathematically, it makes perfect sense to ask this. Yes. Whether the noises can interact and reinforce each other and so on. Yeah. I mean, but uh, I, mean, I, I don't know in, in the biological context what, I mean, you know, instead of product of Gaussians, you can have only the terms non, non Gaussian and so on and so on. Yeah. So, which can reinforce. Yes. Uh, one, one noise can reinforce the other. And so on. Yeah. But also, noise can cancel out. Yeah. Yeah. Also. Yeah. So, uh, if that is not mathematically understood, and biologically, we know that noise can actually come together or noise can kind of be out. Yeah. We can actually think about, I mean, it's not just me, I'm sure many of our colleagues in the biology world can also produce similar data. And there are phase transitions, for example, development itself is a phase transition, right? You have you know a, a particular state of an organism and you want to suddenly make you know, shift into another state, right? Space transition in some sense. That also needs cancelling out of noise to make sure that there are new um, so how do you handle nonsense something that works? what's the case transition? What, what do you mean by phase transition? Okay, transition could be simply changing the phenomenon. Yes. I could describe that as a phase transition. You know, like development of nonsense could be a phase transition. I have a, a cell that had no particular property and it suddenly becomes new. This is a phase transition. Right? I could call this as a phase transition. And for this phase transition to happen, I also need to not just think about signals but also about the noise. So here you are really talking about noise and not signals. So signals which are different in some video. I'm actually only talking about noise because signals people are easy, I mean, relatively easy to handle. Noise is not easy to handle. Is it there? Is it true? Yeah. Noise can be physics that where it's known that how noises can do some kind of large scale order. Okay. But there are simple noises. Okay. I don't know how that apply in the biology, but at least at the level of very simple minus physics stochastic models, mm. uh, people have studied how noise can induce order and mm. not huh. But it's but if you have multiple noise systems, okay. how does noise interact with how do noise noise can interact with each other become better? Okay. Right? If I'm thinking about a you know a, a, a single component, maybe you're right. How does noise Create order lately. I mean, I've looked at some papers, people have done that. But if I have two noisy parameters which give me the same output, or, or I have to interact with each other to give me the output, how do the noise interact with each other? I don't know if that is right. How does one noise generate order yet? But if I have multiple components that each of them have a different amplitude of noise and frequency, <clears throat> what is the how will the interaction happen? Yeah, you're saying that you can't think of it as like averaged out noise. No, like three of them and average. No, that is not something about that. Something more. Interesting. Yeah, you do have noise averaging in corporates, right? But it's not always. I can amplify in noise. For example, if, if I have to produce um, so suppose if I have a gene that is producing mRNA at some noise level. And this is made into protein at some noise level, right? And this protein has to consume glucose at some noise level. I can think about either this cancelling the noise or amplifying the noise. And along with the amount of glucose that is producing, which is more noisy, I can have, I don't know how, on, on what parameter space that this will interact with. And how does this collectively generate order? Because there is all. That's one of the most interesting questions that I would want to ask. Right? Because I can, in principle, me and all my colleagues here can measure several of these problems. Okay. And one noise giving order, good. Two or three different noises giving you order. So with that, I will stop because I think we're also past time. And um, yeah, that's what I said. Noise, noise interaction is, uh, is is unclear. And we can think about multiple things happening. Why is this exciting about studying in the context of physiological transitions? Like I said, all of us go through, suppose if I give, in fact, this is known. If you take, and this is statistically, sorry, this is statistically significant. If you take all monozygotic twins, Right, which means they have the same genes. Monozygotes are basically coming from the same zygote. Right? They are identical twins. Right? If you take identical twins, 
the phenotypic outcomes are unpredictable, right? One of them might be fitter than the other, right? And of course, the confounding principle there is that, oh, you know, you know, what kind of food they ate, when did they sleep, when did they wake up, what kind of exercise did they do, uh, did they, you know, drink one, you know, pint of beer, whatever, right? But then the principle there is now, if I do a statistical sampling, I'll get exactly the same thing. If I take identical twins, I'll always get non-identical output, right? So that means there is an emergent property here, whereas the genes are giving me order, but I'm still producing noise, but it's still deterministic and gives me an output again. <coughs> Even if you both the same environment, I told you, in mice, you expose them to the same high-fat diet, 50% become fat, 50% don't become fat. Social defeat, right? Amok. Social defeat is a bi-stable phenotype. Some respond, some don't respond. Genetically identical. They come from the same lineage. So what generates this? There's no environment in, in a in that is different. So it happens only during the internal that's the assumption, right? What is the noise? How does that noise give you this very predictable outcome? Is that right? So one is predictable outcome, the other one is deterministic. Yes, both become relevant. And in my opinion, both of these are operating in balance, right? Giving you all the complex unit So can yeah. So if you are trying to find out which one will get cookies and which one will not, which one will get cookies and which one will not? I can do that. I will. Is that your car? My guy. <laughs> I can ask several different questions, right? Uh, the point is, if there is enough uh, interest to think about noise, we and our class is quite good. Yeah, we do that. What is the time? Okay, <laughs> so we can we can discuss that. Yeah, we can design experiments to say what is contributing to it and uh, in principle generate this, but we should probably do this. And I hope that what one thing that I suggested before and is that, can we have, do we all agree, is it useful to have biologists giving me to people like that? So we plan to have at least one at this time. Great, that's a good start. Uh, I hope <laughs> it won't be as bad as mine. Um, and uh, also theory students, if you can interact with biology students, it will be great. And I would say, if we can also create some kind of a journal club where we, Talk to each other, that'll be even more interesting. It need not be limited by our stupid ideas that we are discussing here. You might come up with some better ones. Okay? Okay? Good. Thanks.